Wow, so many schools are working digitally right now. Must be strange for kids to be having class via video chat and taking their tests online. I guess we're lucky we have this technology now. This never would have happened over a century ago. I mean, school in general was a lot different 100 years ago. I wonder how I would have done as a student back then. I guess not that great. I gotta say it on my own head. Welcome to another episode of History is Here. I'm Wilton Historical Society Associate Curator Nick Foster, and I'm here at the Hurlbut Street Schoolhouse because if you haven't guessed by now, on this week's episode, we're gonna explore the history of Wilton Schools. This schoolhouse was first built in 1834. It is the oldest schoolhouse still standing in town. The students who studied here are part of a long line of Wilton school children who were educated in schools of all types and sizes. And today, we're gonna to explore their stories. So let's dive in. Educating children became a main priority of the early English settlers in New England. The Code of 1650, some of the earliest laws passed by the colony of Connecticut, required each town of 50 or more households to hire a teacher to teach children to read and write. And once a town reached 100 households, towns were required to build a dedicated grammar school. Taxes to help fund these schools were also enacted. In December 1728, the newly formed parish of Wilton voted to hire Reverend Robert Sturgeon to serve as the first parish teacher. This is also when the first school districts of Wilton were created, divided into Belden Hill, Pimplewog, and Chestnut Hill. Two more districts were added in 1738. Early classes were held in private homes, barns, or wherever else there was space. The first dedicated schoolhouse, built near today what is Lambert Corners, was not erected until 1741. Some of these early Wilton students went on to continue their education outside of town. Yale University was founded in 1701 to help teach theology to Connecticut colonists, but slowly expanded its curriculum. Wilton resident David Lambert II attended Yale in the 1760s, receiving his bachelor in 1761 and his master's in 1764. Both of David's diplomas are now on display at the Society's Wilton, Siwanog Tribe, English Parish, American Town Exhibition. In 1790, jurisdiction over the town schools moved from the Church Society to the newly formed School Societies. In 1792, Wilton was divided into nine independent school districts, all operating separately. Without the oversight and funding from the church, each school district was left to fend for themselves, and their priority placed on funding the schools varied wildly. In some cases, schools without money simply locked the doors, much to the delight of all the students, I'm sure. Luckily, since then, the amount of funding provided for schools has never, ever, ever been a controversial topic. In 1834, the Hurlbut Street Schoolhouse opened its doors, although it wasn't the first school to be built in that neighborhood. Just a few hundred feet up Hurlbut Street stood the first school building, which counted nearly 90 students. When issues with the structure of that building's roof were discovered, a new building, seen here, was erected in 1833. Public money was used to help pay for the new construction. This is a receipt from town treasurer Samuel Sturgis for the sum of $28.89, which was designated for the new schoolhouse. The usually subpar quality of 19th century public schools in Wilton led to the establishment of several private academies. In 1818, Paul the Olmsted, who graduated from Yale as valedictorian two years earlier, founded the Wilton Academy. It quickly gained a reputation as one of the finest schools in the country, with over half of the students traveling from outside of town to attend. The school provided education for both men and women and remained a prestigious institution throughout the 19th century. One of the less successful private education ventures was that of Charles Whitlock. Whitlock's father had built his own school in Wilton in 1847, where Charles worked. In 1890, Charles had a falling out with his dad and constructed his own academy, the Whitlock Educational Institute on Danbury Road. After driving his father's school out of business, the institute burned to the ground in 1894. Whitlock rebuilt bigger and better across the street, only to have that building also meet its fiery demise in 1896. A new building once again succumbed to a massive blaze in 1903. Whether you believe in destiny or not, it's clear that some higher power did not want Charles Whitlock to be a teacher. Whatever teaching Whitlock did do after the last fire, was done from this desk, now kept in society's collection. 
the state of Connecticut attempted to improve the failing public schools with a series of laws in the mid-1800s. In 1856, towns were given the option to consolidate its independent districts into one town board of education. In 1868, the free school law was passed, requiring all public schools to be free and covered by all taxpayers, rather than having students pay tuition as they had before. Neither law was popular with Wiltonians, and interest for schooling in general was pretty abysmal. In 1868, a little more than half of the 301 registered students in Wilton attended during the winter semester. After several attempts, the vote to consolidate was not accepted until 1909, and it took another 26 years before all the one-room schoolhouses in Wilton would finally close down in favor of the much larger Center School. Center School was the first modern school building in town and first enrolled students in 1928. The wooden one-room schoolhouses of the past were now a four-room brick building complete with cafeteria. By 1935, the increased number of students required a new wing with an additional four classrooms and an auditorium. Wilton's post-war population boom required even more schools for the growing number of students. In 1950, a new junior high school, now Cider Mill School, opened its doors to help accommodate the 220% increase in students between 1950 and 1960. With that, Wilton's modern school system was born. Over the years, Wiltonians have not always agreed on how much to prioritize education, but schools have remained a constant throughout the town's history. To paraphrase the immortal words of Alice Cooper, school may be out for summer, but school's certainly not out forever. As always, thanks for watching. Remember to keep your number two pencil sharp and stay tuned for more history.